everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the use of self DNA in transplant assessment. My name is Deanna Fenton, program manager here at the Alliance, and it's my pleasure to host today's webinar. Now, before we get started with today's presentation, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review with you all. For those of you who are interested in our upcoming webinars, please note, registration is currently open for our next Get Connected webinar on medical and legal aspects of family conflict with the medical team at end of life. That's coming your way on February 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our upcoming transplant webinar on transplant peer mentors, a new approach to enhancing the patient experience. Be sure to join us for that on February 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern. For more information on webinars or to register, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for anyone interested in obtaining continuing education credits, we're offering one set C credit, one nursing contact hour, and one CME credit for this webinar. Please note, we do also offer a certificate of attendance for anyone seeking CEs that are not available. Everyone joining us today is eligible to claim either of these credits or certificates. Please note, prior to receiving your certificate, you'll be asked to complete a brief online evaluation that will allow you the opportunity to provide us with your valuable feedback. If you're listening in a group, as many of you are, please be sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. As a friendly reminder, you'll have 30 calendar days to complete your evaluation and claim your credits. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's Q&A discussion, Wade Liu, Vice President of Product Development at Transplant. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce both of our presenters for today's webinar. We are joined by Dr. Phil Gautier, who was raised in Long Island, New York, and came to Tulane University for medical school. He decided to stay on for his residency in internal medicine and was selected to serve as chief resident for the year of 1997 to 1998. He next received his nephrology training at Tulane University with additional training in transplant nephrology at Vanderbilt University. He joined the faculty at Tulane University in July 2000 and served as the director of transplant nephrology for four years. He then served as the director of transplant medicine for the Centaur Transplant Program in Denver, Colorado. He then served as the Centaur Medical Director. Most recently, he joined Atera as a medical director of transplant. We are also joined today by Dr. Alexander Wiseman, who is the Executive Director of Kidney Transplantation at the Centura Transplant Institute in Denver, Colorado. He completed both his undergraduate and medical school training at Washington University, followed by residency training in internal medicine at University of California, and completed his nephrology and transplant nephrology fellowships at University of Colorado. He was previously a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado and was medical director for kidney and pancreas transplantation programs. Dr. Wiseman's interests include access to transplantation, organ allocation and utilization, novel immunosuppressive strategies, and transplant therapy for diabetes. He has served as chair for a number of ASN and AST supported meetings, has given over 200 invited lectures nationally and internationally, and is an associate editor for the American Journal of Transplantation. Dr. Wiseman and Dr. Gautier, we're so happy to have you join us today. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to begin our presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Phil Gautier, and today we're going to talk about cell-free DNA in transplant assessment. The objectives of this talk are as follows, to describe cell-free DNA science and its application to patient care, explain how donor-derived cell-free DNA can be used in transplant rejection assessment, recall the current literature comparing donor-derived cell-free DNA testing to current standard of care in transplant rejection assessment, and to summarize how cell-free DNA technology applications can expand through ongoing research initiatives. I do have the following disclosures. I am the full-time medical director of transplant for Natera based in San Carlos, California. This company performs market cell-free DNA testing for prenatal oncology and transplantation. Hello, my name is Alex Wiseman. I will be joining uh, Dr. Gauthier for this webinar presentation, and my disclosure slide is as follows. In the last 36 months, I've been a consultant for Hansa, Malincrot, Sanofi Genzyme, CTI, Veloxus, and more recently, CareDX and Natera. Grant support has been Astellas, Bristol-Myers Squibb, CareDX, Meteor, and Novartis. So let's begin by briefly reviewing the science of cell-free DNA and uh, DNA and genes in general. So in the 20th century, we really saw an explosion in the science of uh, genetics. So 
in the 1800s, Mendel actually first did the experiments with his peas and first described Mendelian genetics, although his work was very under-recognized at the time. It wasn't until Thomas Morgan started experimenting with fruit flies in the early 1900s that he gave Mendel the credit he deserved and named the classic Mendelian genetics. We then discovered chromosomes and genomes. Uh, genes are the subset of chromosomes that actually code for proteins, and they're only about 2% of the total DNA in most species. We then discovered bacterial transformation. Griffiths and his uh, group did experiments showing that uh, dead bacteria could transmit something to live bacteria, which could make them more virulent. And he realized fairly quickly that what they were transmitting must be some type of genetic material. We then were able to really determine the structure and sequence. Of course, as we all know, Watson and Crick first discovered and described the structure of DNA, the double helix structure, in 1953. And we then were able to sequence the entire genome. This was uh, completed in 2004. And what's amazing is it cost $3 billion to sequence the human genome for the first time, but 10 years later, they could do it for a million dollars, and then five or six years after that, it was under $1,000, and we're now really approaching the under $100 price point for whole genome sequencing. This is actually much faster than the development in computers. Um, and most recently, we've really gotten into the analysis and modification of genes. We've probably all heard about things like CRISPR, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. Every nucleated cell has a DNA, and it has a role other than being uh, the master molecule. So what is cell-free DNA? Well, cell-free DNA is actually just what it says. It's uh, DNA uh, that is not in the cell. It's floating around in the bloodstream. It enters the bloodstream through apoptosis, which is active program cellular death or necrosis. Uh, there's also some evidence for active release. We're not quite sure exactly how this happens, but there is pretty good evidence that cells that are under some type of stress either by being infected with a virus or undergoing oncological transformation will actively secrete DNA into the bloodstream, which can then trigger an immune response to target that cell. The applications of cell-free DNA include fetal cell-free DNA, tumor cell-free DNA, donor-derived cell-free DNA, and organ transplant, which of course is the topic of this talk, and also cell-free DNA. Cell-free DNA was first discovered in 1948 by Mandel and Natas. DNA fragments are usually a few hundred base pairs in size. They're generally cleaved in the cells during active cell death, i.e. apoptosis, at the nucleosome, and therefore they're released as multiples of nucleosomes, usually about 150 base pairs. As you know, a nucleosome is basically DNA wrapped around a histone, and I'll show you a cartoon on that in a minute so it should be more clear. Since different tissues do have different patterns of histones, the fragmentation pattern in cell-free DNA could actually be useful for determining its tissue of origin. Now, when cell-free DNA is released because of necrosis, this is done much more randomly since necrosis is not an active process. Therefore, we see much longer segments of around uh, 10,000 base pairs. The concentration of cell-free DNA is around 50 nanograms per milliliter on average, Obviously, this is a very small amount. To put it in perspective, you would need all the blood from about 3,400 people in order to extract one gram of uh, cell-free DNA. So there's very small amounts. It has a 30 to 90-minute half-life. We're not 100% clear on how it is eliminated. It's certainly not renally cleared because the half-life does not change in patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, there is some evidence for um, active degradation by enzymes. And this is the cartoon I promised. So this shows you the classic beads on a string structure of DNA, that is the DNA molecule itself wrapped around um, histones, which are then kind of packed together. Uh, the little arrow shows you the cleavage site. It's right between the histones. So each fragment of cell-free DNA generally consists of one, sometimes two or three histones with the DNA wrapped around it. There are many um, utilities to cell-free DNA measurements. These are just some of the articles that have been published on it. I'll touch very briefly on its use for prenatal oncology. 
in the prenatal space, cell-free DNA can be used to find um, fetal DNA circulating in the mother as early as 10 weeks, and this fetal DNA can then be analyzed for various chromosomal variants, also gender. In oncology, we can actually detect circulating tumor DNA, which could then predict tumor recurrence. Donor-derived cell-free DNA is um, DNA that comes from an organ donor that can be found in a recipient, and there's been several articles, many articles really, in several different organs describing the use of cell-free DNA in transplant recipients that has been derived for the donor, and we'll go into that in much more detail. So how do we apply uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA? Well, first we have to find it. So the way we do that is we analyze what are called SNPs. Now, SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. They're that small percentage, about 1% of our uh, DNA that is actually different between different people. And when you have an organ transplant, you'll have perhaps some circulating donor-derived cell-free DNA in your bloodstream, and we can distinguish that from your own DNA because it has different SNPs. In fact, by analyzing the SNPs, we can tell you exactly, exactly what percentage of your total cell-free DNA comes from your donor. Now, if everything's going well with the organ, we would expect that they'd be very little donor-derived cell-free DNA. However, if things aren't going so well, if the organ is um, experiencing rejection or perhaps other types of cell injury, then the amount of donor-derived cell-free DNA can go up. And this has clinical utility with regards to diagnosing rejection. So when the kidney transplant is happy and nothing's going on, we would expect low levels of cell-free DNA. If an early rejection intervenes, we might see the cell-free DNA start to increase at some time point, uh, often before we actually see any clinical evidence of rejection. And then we would expect the donor-derived cell-free DNA would peak uh, during the active rejection phase. Uh, as rejection clears and begins to heal, this donor-derived cell-free DNA would decrease, and then eventually we would hope it would return to baseline as the injury to the allograft completely resolves. Therefore, the precise measurement and characterization of cell-free DNA allows for a non-invasive assessment of clinical conditions and may improve care management in kidney transplant recipients. So let's talk about cell-free DNA compared to the current standard of care in transplant rejection assessment. But first, let's define the problem. So transplant is overall highly successful, especially in the short term. However, long-term outcomes aren't as great. In fact, as you can see by the graph below, average 10-year graft survival for recipients of deceased donor kidneys is only about 45 to 50%. And more concerningly, it doesn't seem to have improved very much, if at all, over the last 10 years or so. For recipients of a graft from a living donor, the outlook is significantly better. They have better one, five, and 10-year graft survival but the 10-year graft survival is still only about 65%. So quite a few of them still do fail after some period of time. And again, that does not seem to have improved much at all over the last 10 years. The cause for this late graft loss is fairly clearly rejection. So this was a study that was done looking at the causes of rejection and, I'm sorry, the causes of late graft loss. They were eight patients that received a biopsy shortly before their kidney transplants failed, and the pie graph showed you the results of the biopsies. As you can see, the vast majority of patients had antibody-mediated rejection. It was about when you include probable ABMR and mixed rejection, it was close to 60%. It's actually 64%. So most patients who lost their allografts after some period of time had rejection as a cause for their graft loss. Interestingly, many of those patients were non-adherent. About 47% of them were non-adherent. So obviously non-adherence is a major component as well. And at I'm this going point, to, uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Weisman. Yeah, 
Thank you, Dr. Gauthier. I'm going to now discuss exactly how we identify that immunologic injury uh, using today's standard of care and seeing if uh, utilizing other biomarkers or other surveillance tools uh, may be of value. <clears throat> so as you can see on the current slide, our current standard of care, which most transplant centers essentially follow, is that we perform therapeutic drug monitoring for our immunosuppression medications. Most centers will screen for BK virus, some will screen for donor-specific antibodies, and even fewer will perform surveillance biopsies. Now, to try to identify exactly that uh, immunologic injury pattern before it happens is key. And so uh, a key uh, driving force in our field is really the identification of a biomarker or biomarkers that could identify um, early graft injury patterns or early immunologic injury patterns prior to more permanent um, histologic and functional injury. Those include donor-derived cell-free DNA, and we'll discuss this. Others that are beyond the scope of today's talk include blood gene expression profiles, such as TrueGraph or KSORs you may hear about, uh, and urine biomarkers are also uh, in developmental phases, such as CXCL9 chemokine measurements or gene expression profiles. Just in talking about the, again, standard of care and those potential surveillance uh, strategies, what does a surveillance biopsy tell us and how helpful is it? So essentially, how, how frequently do centers utilize surveillance biopsies? A UNOS survey actually sent to 238 centers, of which 106 responded, essentially identified that only about 17% of centers perform surveillance biopsies on all patients. This is an invasive procedure, clearly, and it is time intensive and center and resource intensive. 1% perform biopsy for select cases, and essentially the most, time, the most common time points for surveillance biopsies were at the three-month and 12-month time point post-transplant. When you discuss whether or not this was advantageous in terms of predicting or um, associated with better outcomes uh, in the long term, if you actually look at the O to E ratios, the observed over expected graph loss ratios at the one and three year point, basically you see that the O to E ratio was 0.88 and it was a non-statistically significant difference between those centers that performed surveillance biopsies and those that did not. So this is really not necessarily a magic bullet to, to improve graft outcomes and it's not very widely used either, again, because of its uh, time and resource intensive nature. When one has looked specifically at the findings in surveillance biopsies, a large French cohort uh, followed patients who were biopsied at the one-year point and looked at uh, graft survival at the, over the next uh, subsequent seven years, so eight-year follow-up. And what you can see on this slide is that when identified at the one-year point, acute antibody-mediated rejection or active antibody mediated rejection actually was associated with worse graft survival. And that's the red line uh, to the right in the survival curve. It is also associated with a decline in GFR, not surprisingly, and that's the uh, left-hand side GFR curve over time. Interestingly, T cell mediated rejection, which is seen here in blue, was not necessarily associated with a difference in uh, GFR trajectory over time or graft survival at that eight-year point. So this essentially goes back to Dr. Gauthier's point about uh, immunologic injury patterns and predictors or uh, causes of graft loss. And this is really an alloimmune antibody-mediated uh, process rather than a cellular-mediated process, uh, although there's a, a lot of conflicting data in terms of the severity of T-cell-mediated rejection and perhaps Subclinical T cell meter rejection is not all, always equal uh, by definitions uh, found on biopsy. One could look at earlier time points for surveillance biopsies, and, and this is an, um, what I would consider one of the first iterations of early post transplant surveillance biopsy studies. This was done by the Mayo Clinic looking at one month, four month, and 12 month protocol biopsies. And interestingly enough, looking at various findings based upon groups, they were grouped into four categories, 
Group one showed no inflammation or rejection at the one or four month biopsy point. Group two showed some clinical inflammation, but not meeting criteria for rejection at either one or four months. Group three showed subclinical acute rejection at either the one or four month point. And then group four was the four cause biopsy cohort in patients who had clinically uh, required or clinically indicated biopsies and were treated. Group three in this uh, study received one dose of solumedrol, while group four received three doses of solumedrol in terms of treatment at that one or four month or at uh, the four cause need for a biopsy. And you can see the fibrosis score is then sampled at the one year surveillance biopsy. And so what this really shows is that if you biopsy early, i.e. at the one or four month point, you may find subclinical inflammation. And if you find subclinical inflammation, that is actually associated with worse interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy at the one year point. So 34% of those patients in group two that were subclinical inflammation, not even rejection, and not treated per se, definitely had higher rates of uh, fibrosis scores uh, than those that did not have such inflammation. So again, this is a predictor of uh, histology over time and could be used as surveillance. Uh, what one does about subclinical inflammation or subclinical acute rejection is still unclear. As you can see, one dose of solumedrol for group three did not necessarily result in a reduction in interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy scores. Actually, they were worse than those patients that had, uh, there's a higher frequency of uh, fibrosis uh, and atrophy compared to those that were treated for clinically indicated acute rejection. So if we're not able to truly use surveillance biopsies <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a prognostic or diagnostic tool for, again, for logistical or for programmatic reasons, one might look at um, less invasive tools, such as measuring for allo antibody or donor-specific antibody. This is a now classic slide demonstrating that when sampled prospectively, if you measure donor uh, for de novo DSA and find it over time, that is associated with worse 10-year uh, graft survival than it's indicated in red. There are a number of subsequent studies that have linked this to adherence, have linked this to epitope mismatching. And um, what I will show you on the next slide is that it's also linked to appropriate immunosuppression dosing. So looking specifically at calcineurin inhibitor dosing to chromes-based immunosuppression, you can see that um, this slide rep is representative of that uh, center study, which is now uh, reflected in tacrolimus troughs at the varying points over time um, and its relationship to donor-specific antibody formation. As you can see gray along the top bar, this is a fairly busy slide, but if you notice that it's six months, one year, all the way out to eight years post-transplant, those patients that formed donor-specific antibody had a reduction in exposure to tacrolimus in the six months preceding the development of donor-specific antibody. So tacrolimus trough levels prior to forming DSA in blue, and then immediately within six months of forming DSA in red. You can see throughout the time frame, red, uh, red levels were lower than the blue levels over time. And this is compared to those that never formed a DSA, which is seen in green over time. So a fairly stable tacrolimus trough uh, exposure in those that did not form DSA. So this, again, suggests that in, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring and its association over time can predict DSA formation, and then the, the next step in that logic chain would be that DSA formation is associated with worse grant outcomes. This is all fairly retrospective. There's another retrospective analysis that proves a similar point. Uh, this is a study of a single center study of 543 transplant recipients uh, over the course of 2007 to 2013 on tachromus based therapies and looking for specifically uh, the appropriate tachromus trough exposure range over time in the first year and its association with DSA. You can see uh, the percentages that were de novo DSA free based on the mean tacrolimus trough levels uh, over the first year post-transplant, and it's definitely a graded uh, difference. 
And uh, odds ratios for DSA adjusted for HLA mismatches, age, sex, and ethnicity, donor type, induction therapy, and DGF. You can see that any level, any mean trough level exposure less than eight was associated with an increased odds for formation of de novo DNA. Obviously, the highest at the in those that were minimally exposed to tacrolimus levels, uh, zero to three point nine, with a odds ratio of five point seven. So, hopefully, what the, these slides demonstrate is that there is um, a need for better surveillance tools that we do utilize our information with biopsies and donor-specific antibody and, and immunologic uh, or uh, therapeutic drug monitoring in a way for it to be predictive. It is very difficult to act upon those findings, as you can see, averaging the mean tacrolimus trough levels requires time in order to, to actually accrue for you then to retrospectively go back. We don't necessarily have great therapies per se to treat to, uh, DSA formation, and nor do we know if DSA formation is all the same in each patient, whether or not one DSA is more pathogenic than other. So I think there's definitely an opportunity to uh, improve upon this uh, practice of immunologic monitoring. So let's look at the use then of donor-derived cell-free DNA as a way that we could monitor these graphs immunologically and detect rejection earlier. So this is one of the first papers looking at that topic. And this was the DART study, and it was the first multi-center study using a donor-derived cell-free DNA to determine the donor fraction of cell-free DNA using the SNPs and then seeing if that correlated to rejection. It was 102 kidney transplant um, recipients. So they chose 1% as a cutoff for a positive test. And as these graphs show you, and the blue line is the 1%, the patients in this study that had antibody-mediated rejection, either chronic active or acute active, had a median cell-free DNA from the donor that was 2.9%, so significantly above the 1% cutoff. The patients that had TCMR uh, had a donor-derived cell-free DNA that was slightly higher, 1.2% was, was not statistically significant. Now, on the right here, they broke this down further into patients with no active rejection, and as you can see, their um, median is below 1%. They looked at patients with TCMR1A, and their median was even lower. Uh, patients with TCMR1B or higher had a median donor-derived cell-free DNA that was above the 1%, and this was statistically significant. However, it's important to note that most of the patients in this group also had mixed ABMR, so this was not pure TCMR, it was uh, TCMR and ABMR. They were then able to calculate the sensitivity and specificity for uh, this test using a predefined cutoff of 1% to predict rejection, and they determined it had a 59.3% sensitivity and an 84.7% specificity, giving it a PPV of 60.6% and a negative predictive value of 84%. The area under the curve for cell-free DNA was 0.74. This was a lot better than serum carotene. The area under the curve for serum carotene to predict rejection was 0.54, so little better than a coin flip. And another reminder that serum carotene is simply not a sensitive indicator for rejection. They further refined their results by looking at the combination of DSA and border drive cell-free DNA. As Alex was mentioning, uh, positive DSA can indicate rejection or is certainly a risk factor for rejection. Um, so they wondered if they could combine both donor-derived cell-free DNA and uh, DSAs, what would that would do to the numbers. So they looked at that and you can see the results. So the positive predictive value, and this is specifically for ABMR, not ABMR and TCMR, but just ABMR. The PPV uh, for donor-derived cell-free DNA alone was 44%. For DSA alone, it was 48%. But if they were both positive, the PPV went up to 81%, so very significant. There's another study looking at another um, type of donor-derived cell-free DNA test. Uh, this is the second-generation test. And this study was done as part of a biobank. It was 193 transplant patients. And 
They had all had biopsies and they had matched plasma. About half of these biopsies were for cause biopsies and the other half were surveillance biopsies. This test uses 13,000 SNPs to determine the fraction of donor-derived cell-free DNA. And the more SNPs you use, the more accurate your fraction is. Um, again, they used a predefined cutoff of 1%. It was a retrospective study. All, pathology, all specimens were read by a single pathologist at UCSF and graded according to the 2017 BAMF criteria. Um, so this is just a flowchart of the study structure. So we started off with 277 samples from 178 unique recipients. Uh, some were excluded because they were either at day zero or they could not be sequenced. So then we were left with our study cohort. Of the study cohort, 38 patients had some form of acute rejection. 72 patients had borderline rejection. 82 patients had completely normal allografts, and 25 patients had other injuries. This was defined as patients who had an elevated serum creatinine and therefore underwent a biopsy uh, but did not have rejection. They either had ATN or calcineurin inhibitor toxicity or even a normal biopsy. These three groups, the borderline group, the stable group, and the other injury group were all defined as the non-acute rejection group, giving us two groups in the end. This just shows you the demographics of the group, uh, fairly diverse, with perhaps some over-representation compared to the rest of the United States of the Asian population. And these um, bar and whisker plots show you the median donor-derived cell-free DNA in each of the four groups. And it's quite apparent, looking at this, that donor-derived cell-free DNA was significantly higher in the acute rejection group than it was in the other three groups. On the right, we have the same data, but using GFR. And it's pretty apparent from this that although GFR was higher in acute rejection, borderline acute rejection, and other injury compared to stable function, there wasn't any significant difference between these three groups as there was with donor drive cell-free DNA. Again, these investigators were able to calculate a um, sensitivity and specificity but first, we'll look at the median. So for the acute rejection group, the median donor drive cell-free DNA was 2.32%. And in the acute rejection group, it was only 0.47%. Again, with GFR, you had less ability to distinguish acute rejection from the other groups of borderline or other injury. So the conclusion was that donor drive cell-free DNA does appear to have the ability to identify injury earlier than eGFR. So the specificity that was calculated was 72.6%, and the sensitivity was 88.7%, with an area under the curve of 0 0.87, PPV 52 and NPV 95. So quite a good uh, negative predictive value. This compares to uh, a GFR less than 60 that has a sensitivity of only 67, specificity of only 65, and AUC is 0.74. Um, positive predictive value was 39, and negative predictive value was 85. So clearly, donor-derived cell-free DNA was significantly superior to uh, GFR for detecting rejection. These investigators also looked at it for the different types of rejection. And as you can see, uh, the median donor-derived cell-free DNA was actually quite similar between these three groups, pure ABMR, pure TCMR, and mixed ABMR, TCMR. So unlike the first-generation study, it does seem that this study was able to detect TCMR just as effectively as it, as it was able to detect ABMR and mixed rejection. In fact, there were 10 patients in the study that had pure T cell mediated rejection, and all 10 had a donor drive cell free DNA above 1% and therefore tested positive. So, summary of the results of this study um, again, the median was a lot higher in the acute rejection group compared to the other groups. Uh, sensitivity and specificity, we've already gone over, so we don't need to repeat. Certainly a superior performance to the current standard of care. So this study validates the use of donorized cell-free DNA in the blood as an accurate indicator of kidney injury and rejection across a range of pathologies and both acute and chronic findings. So I'd like to now put those data into perspective as we think about using uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA in the clinic. So 
as just a example, let's just discuss a, a case study in which um, an individual, a 49-year-old African-American male, underwent a kidney transplant, a uh, deceased donor transplant with a KDPI of 6%. You can see the HLA match was a one match with a negative cr uh, cross match. The close ischemia time was low. All went well post-transplant with rapid ATG induction and three-drug three immunosuppression, tacrolimus, MPA, and prednisone. During the first year, uh, tacrolimus trough levels ranged from 4.4 to 7.9 on 5 milligrams twice daily with a mean tacrolimus trough of uh, 6.4 nanograms per mil over that first year, and no do donor-specific antibodies were identified at the year one point. <clears throat> During the second year, year one to two, Sacrolimus troughs were monitored and drawn monthly. Those ranges were 4.7 to 10.1 with a mean of 6.3. But trending at the end of that calendar or end of that uh, year one time frame, uh, the levels were a bit lower. There was no dose of made, no dose changes, it's still on five milligrams twice daily, and at 23 months post-transplant, uh, his creatinine actually had risen from 1.3 to 1.6, his tachromus trough was 4.7, so at the lower point of um, his year-long measures. No proteinuria was identified, his ultrasound was normal. At this point, a donor-derived cell-free DNA was uh, drawn and measured and was 1.13%. At 24 months, post-transplant, he returned to the clinic, and his creatinine was increased further to 2.0. Still no hydronephrosis, urinalysis negative, no proteinuria, BK virus screening was negative. And his um, uh, antibody screening was performed with a PRA that had increased from 0 to 79%, and a distinct de novo donor-specific antibody formation was uh, detected at uh, the DR53, DR DQ2, and DQ8 uh, low side with fairly high MFIs specifically for the DQ8. So at this point, this patient was uh, brought in for a transplant biopsy. The 24-month biopsy was suboptimal, unfortunately, with only four glomeruli. There was a fixation artifact, one plus C4D staining. Not much one could act upon specifically on the biopsy. A donor-derived cell free DNA at that time had increased from 1.13% to 2.8%. A repeat biopsy showed acute antibody meter rejection, or active antibody meter rejection, with uh, 2 plus C4D staining and 2 plus paratubular capillaritis. It's treated with methoprednisolone times three days, pharesis, low dose IVIG times five treatments, followed by rituximab. And his creatinine had actually risen further during that uh, treatment course to 2.8 milligrams per deciliter. Slowly and subsequently, uh, following treatment, three months after treatment and 27 months after transplant, and his serum creatinine had uh, fallen to 1.8 uh, and had natured at that point. At that point, the donor derived cell free DNA was not detectable, less than uh, detectable limits of uh, less than 1. Point, uh, less than 0.19. His donor specific antibodies still were detected. They were at slightly lower uh, ranges, but still quite uh, elevated. So one can look at this uh, case study and really try to identify, well, what is the proper utility for other immune surveillance? And did the donor-derived cell-free DNA correlate with that? And could it have uh, aided in our identification of an injury pattern prior to an injury? Could it, uh, was it helpful during more active injury and also uh, subsequent to treatment? So, a big question in the clinic is truly when, when is it best to measure donor-derived cell-free DNA? Should we measure it in otherwise stable kidney grafts? Does it identify the absence of clinical, subclinical injury, for example, if low? For those with clinical allograft dysfunction, would it actually predict specific injury patterns? Does it predict rejection rather than other injury patterns? With the, um, in the setting of a patient who has de novo or increasing uh, donor-specific antibody, does donor-derived cell-free DNA predict specific injury patterns? Is there uh, uh, identifying signature with, uh, with with both the presence of DSA and donor-derived cell-free DNA? And finally, what about just a standard cutoff, and, and should we be using this for all surveillance of 1.0% donor-derived cell-free DNA? Does that actually correlate with specific injury patterns? A single-center study at the University of Colorado 
uh, actually incorporated a, a monitoring strategy similar to the DART study, collecting uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA at one, two, three, four, and six months post-transplant, and then quarterly for the first three years. Patients underwent a surveillance biopsy at three months post-transplant and a biopsy for de novo or increased DSA or for donor-derived cell-free DNA greater than 1% as, you know, as an indication surveillance biopsy. Donor-derived cell-free DNA proportion of greater than 1% was considered positive based upon the DART study, essentially, the published data. And these data were presented at uh, the American Society of Nephrology uh, Kidney Week in 2018. Uh, these have yet to be published, but are soon to be uh, published. Dr. Eric Stites at the University of Colorado is uh, compiling the remainder of these data. But the preliminary findings and those that were reported were as follows. A hundred of of the patients sampled, there were 155 patients, 444 samples in those 155 patients, with at least a contemporaneous biopsy to compare. 27, 27 of those patients had uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA greater than 1%. And they were categorized in those four categories of those clinical questions. Those patients with surveillance biopsies, how many were positive versus negative in a, in a clinically quiescent state at the three-month point those patients that were biopsied for clinical indication, and 10 of those biopsies of the 28 actually had, quote, unquote, positive uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA greater than 1%. And then in the other categories, those patients who were biopsied for de novo DSA, 12 patients were biopsied for de novo DSA, three of those had cell-free DNA as a positive measure. And then finally, in all, all surveillance, not just at the times of clinical um, indication, DSA, or three-month biopsies, there were measures at which uh, donor cell free DNA was greater than 1%, and 14 biopsies in 13 patients were, uh, were identified. The findings in these, looking at positive and negative predictive values for rejection, or features of rejection on biopsy, and those patients that were stable post-transplant, and predominantly these were three-month biopsies, if your uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA was low, the negative predictive value for finding activity on the biopsy was also quite low, negative predictive value of 98%. Those patients that were biopsied for rising serum creatinine, what was the positive predictive value in those patients that had uh, cell-free DNA greater than 1%? It was 60% positive predictive value, and those that had less than 1%, was it correlated with uh, with no rejection on biopsy. That was a negative predictive value of 85%. In those patients that had a de novo DSA formation, positive predictive value of, of 67%, negative predictive value of 77%. And then finally, those patients that just at some time post-transplant had a measure that was greater than 1% of donor-derived cell-free DNA. It's a, in otherwise clinically quiet uh, states, no clinical indication or DSA formation, uh, there was a 50% positive predictive value for rejection in that setting. So to uh, summarize these findings, uh, of the 124 uh, biopsies, seven, uh, seven of those biopsies with a negative uh, self review were diagnosed with rejection overall, giving you a negative predictive value for rejection in in a low-value uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA state of about 95%. And those patients that had elevation in their uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA, those 29 biopsies, 14 were consistent with rejection, 13 without any pathologic abnormality, one with glomerulitis only, and one with, some di with findings of glomerular injury, diabetic nephropathy, and secondary FSGS. So if you were to summarize these findings, I think that at least in these preliminary data, one might find uh, the following conclusions. That in this setting of a stable allograft, the negative predictive value of donor cell-free DNA is quite high, and thus it may obviate the need for a biopsy if one were uh, considering doing surveillance biopsies, for example. In those patients with de novo or increasing donor-specific antibody, the negative predictive value, so if you, one were to measure uh, donor-derived cell-free DNA and it be low, the negative predictive value is 77%, while a positive predictive value is 67%. These are very small preliminary numbers, uh, so take uh, the data uh, for what they are, 
But looking at the negative and positive predictive value of this study, as well as the, the uh, post hoc analysis published by Jordan in the DART study, it may not be quite good enough to, to preclude a biopsy. That one, if you find donors, uh, donor specific antibody, it may, the positive or negative predictive value of, of donor drive cell free DNA may not be of the 95% or 50% uh, ratios that we're talking about. Finally, uh, does, a, does the value, if one measures uh, in a clinically quiescent state, a donor drive cell free DNA greater than 1%, to correlate with the specific injury patterns? So this would be the scenario where one is simply measuring this in the clinic as a function of standard protocols. And if you find it, there's about a 50% chance, essentially positive predictive value, that there is rejection on that biopsy that would not otherwise be identified. So it could be a potentially good marker for intervention. But of course, one has to keep in mind that about less than 5% of tests are, all, are, are greater than 1%. So it would take a great number of surveillance tests in order to identify those patients. I do think that donor drive cell free DNA does uh, address some significant unmet needs. I think that not only the case, but also these preliminary data highlight those potential needs or, or identify uh, areas that donor drive cell free DNA may contribute. So we could consider using this as a tool in patients who we are not, um, would have concerns about doing a biopsy, anticoagulated patients, obese, intraperitoneal kidneys, or again, complicated uh, logistics, whether it's a center or geography or patient-related effect. If we had a negative predictive value that would preclude biopsy, this could be quite helpful. We could streamline or tailor immune surveillance to high-risk patients. So if in the surveillance uh, setting, we could be focusing upon looking for subclinical rejection, looking at opportunities for immunosuppression weaning or optimization. Perhaps we would measure this in patients with uh, history of rejection, de novo DSA, retransplant status, or high PRA. And then finally, we could use it as a supplement to our four-cause assessment. You know, perhaps as in the case pre presented, a non-diagnostic biopsy. If we were uncomfortable with a repeat biopsy, perhaps uh, donor drive cell free DNA could guide us in one way or another to push whether a biopsy was necessary or unnecessary. Uh, and then, again, we could potentially use this as host transplant monitoring and uh, dictate whether or not post-transplant biopsy or treatment was successful or, or necessary. Uh, you could see the trends of donor drive cell free DNA in the case presented, and it uh, did correlate with uh, clinical quiescence and activity based upon uh, biopsy findings. So this will obviously lead to a number of questions, and I think there's a lot of ongoing research in this area. And I think that some of the research questions that are being asked and, will, uh, and data will be available within uh, the coming months to uh, short-term years uh, will be the following. Can cell free DNA be used to monitor treatment response? What are the effects of BK virus and donor-derived cell free DNA measures? How important is it to detect T cell media rejection? Should we focus on antibody media rejection? Is there a differential in terms of the severity of T cell media rejection? Is there a type of uh, T cell media rejection that is associated with high le higher levels of donor-derived cell free DNA that's more uh, pathogenic and predictive of poor outcomes than one with low donor-derived cell free DNA? And again, one question is, should we be using the biopsy as a gold standard, or should we be comparing against uh, genomic analysis of biopsy tissue or other parameters and using other supplementary tools such as donor derived cell free DNA. When we use the test, how we use the test, we're all still uh, in the process of, of investigating should it be used for surveillance in a steady state patient or only for cause or for both? Will it be able to allow us to skip biopsies completely? What are the impacts upon other uh, of having other transplants in the mix, such as a simultaneous organ transplant or sequential organ transplant, and the, and the measures of donor drive cell free DNA in, the, in that regard? I think these are all very important questions, and all questions that uh, will uh, be asked and uh, will be attempted to be answered in the in the coming months. 
I think that at this point uh, we, we have some very promising data to really support uh, its uh, utility as a potential um, uh, surveillance tool and biomarker for injury patterns, particularly uh, rejection injury patterns. So to conclude, I think DNA clearly is an informative molecule and selfie DNA may allow for non-invasive assessment for important conditions. It is an important new technology to de detect acute rejection in renal transplantation as more informative than our existing tools, in particular our serologic measures of uh, serum creatinine, for example. First generation test uh, was proven to be uh, effective at differentiating antibody meter rejection from a quiescent state, uh, less so for T cell meter rejection. Second generation testing uh, tended to show uh, better differentiators from both antibody and T cell meter rejection and the quiescent state. And uh, this may have to do with the different uh, lab technologies between the two tests. And with that, I think we will close the, this webinar. And uh, we very much appreciate your uh, participation and uh, look forward to further discussions on this topic in the future. All right. Thank you both. On behalf of the Alliance, I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to both Dr. Gauthier and Dr. Wiseman for providing such a comprehensive overview on the use of cell-free DNA. We appreciate you both joining us today and sharing your expertise on this topic. And to all of our participants, we thank you for taking the time to join us, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Have a great day, everyone.